وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims, but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known, and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Seerah, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30 including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Afifa Khawaja and welcome to Muslim Perspectives, a weekly program dedicated to bringing you news about the Muslim community, both at the local as well as the international levels. As we all know, the month of Ramadan is fast approaching, and to discuss some aspects of it, we have Brother Zafar Bangish here with us. Welcome to the program, Brother Zafar. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, the glorious month of Ramadan is upon us soon, and it's preceded by the month of Sha'ban. What, what is the significance of this month? Uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, the month of Shaban is also important um, because uh, it not only precedes the month of Ramadan, but um, in the early history of Islam, um, uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to keep track of the days of Shaban very carefully so that um, it would then um, help in determining the start of Ramadan, number one. Secondly, uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to fast regularly in the month of Shaban mm -hmm. as uh, almost like training for the month of Ramadan itself. Because in Ramadan, obviously, uh, we have to fast for 29 or 30 days and it is every day. Uh, in Shaban, we don't have to fast every day and it's not compulsory, yet it is useful to fast in Shaban as well so that we can begin to prepare ourselves for Ramadan. But isn't it true that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us not to fast on the 29th or the 30th day of Shaban? Yes, this is absolutely correct. Um, he said that and it was for a very good reason because um, those are uh, the days or dates uh, on which there may be uh, some uh, uncertainty or doubt as to whether it's the 29th of Shaban or, or the 30th of Shaban or the 1st of Ramadan. Um, so in that sense, uh, he told us not to fast on those days so that we don't run into that confusion. At the same time, uh, people who are Muslims who fast regularly in Shaban and they are keeping track of uh, the days of the month of Shaban. For them, it is okay. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself used to fast uh, in Shaban so regularly that he was naturally keeping uh, close track of uh, the days of Shaban, so there was no confusion. But for an average Muslim, yes, it is um, strongly recommended by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Muslims should not fast on the 29th or 30th of Shaban. 
Now, I'm sure there's quite a bit, quite a number of verses in the Quran relating to Ramadan, but could you enlighten us with some of them? Yes, uh, you are right. There are many verses, um, and uh, the two of them that are um, absolutely particular to the month of Ramadan, uh, they are in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, first um, ayat number 183. And uh, the, the other one, uh, following pretty closely by, which is ayat number 185. Mm -hmm. uh, what in fact uh, I would uh, suggest is that, uh, first of all, we are going to listen to uh, these ayats. Okay. Uh, they are being recited by, you know, Akari with a beautiful recitation. And we would have the meanings of these ayats also. And then, inshallah, we're going to talk about them. So let's listen to these ayats uh, as they are reciting. Okay. 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 So, uh, as, as we see uh, from the recitation of these ayats, uh, first of all, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing a very specific group of people that have been referred to in the Quran as Ya Ayyuhallazina Amanu. It's a very special category of people, Muslims, uh, but those Muslims uh, that have made a, a very firm commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, O oh, you who have made a firm commitment to Allah, fasting has been prescribed for you or ordained for you as it was ordained for people before you. And then the ayat actually explains the purpose as well, so that you may achieve taqwa. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful word, taqwa. Uh, and it means a lot more than piety. It actually means when, as Muslims, we are conscious of Allah's divine power presence and we are consciously striving to do the best, to be on our best behavior, to do the things that Allah has commanded us to do and not to do that He has uh, prohibited us from doing, then that sort of falls under the category of taqwa. Mm -hmm. So, Fasting has been linked with achieving taqwa. Now, in the next ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies and He says, Shahru Ramadan al-lazi unzila fihi al-Qur'ana hudal linnas wa bayyinatim min al-huda wal furqan. Okay, now Allah says that it was in the month of Ramadan that the noble Qur'an was uh, revealed or sent and it was sent as a guidance for all mankind not just for any particular group, but it was guidance for all mankind. Right. And there are clear signs of guidance. There are clear signs of guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, and Furqan, of course, is the balance. That means that the Quran basically determines for us what is right and what is wrong. So, on the one hand, Allah says that this Quran is a guidance for all mankind, for everybody that wishes to achieve guidance from it, they will get guidance from it. But at the same time, in the same surah at the beginning, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says and reminds us that only those people will achieve guidance who are muttaqeen, who have achieved taqwa. Okay? Right. right in the beginning of surah al-Baqarah, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, that this is a book in which there is no doubt but it has or it provides guidance only for those who have taqwa okay so although it is available to everybody to seek guidance from but only those will get guidance from it who have taqwa and one of the ways to achieve taqwa is of course through fasting so here is the link between the quran the month of Ramadan, fasting, guidance, and taqwa. I want to stay on the topic of guidance because we know that there's a lot of people who get confused about when Ramadan starts, when it ends, and it becomes quite controversial. So how can we avoid this? 
Well, it's a, again a very good question. You see, uh, the reason why uh, Muslims uh, run into this confusion is that uh, very often um, somebody would sort of, you know, get a call from somewhere in the Middle East or wherever and say, oh, somebody has sighted the moon over there. Uh, and that, of course, leads to endless confusion um, among Muslims over here. And it is a regular occurrence. And, mm -hmm. I, and I pray and I, you know, beg my brothers and sisters to avoid this kind of confusion because it simply creates so many problems for us which are completely unnecessary. That's right. Uh, you see, there is not only a clear guidance uh, in the Quran, um, and that is very important. For instance, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Yes, alunaka anil ahilla qul hiya mawaqeetu lil nasi wal hajj. Addressing the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that people will ask you about the new moons, uh, the new hilal. Ahilla is a plural of hilal. Mm -hmm. And hilal is that uh, crescent that becomes visible in the sky. So that means that it is clearly linked with the visibility of the moon, the new moon. And Allah says that these are to determine the seasons and the time of Hajj. That, of course, seasons includes Ramadan as well. So the Quranic guidance is very clear that whenever we want to start Ramadan, we must start by sighting the moon. Number two, there is also a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we should... Um, for every locality, every area, that people themselves must determine in that area when the moon was sighted. Okay. Now, if that is the case, then obviously all of these um, claims that people make, well, somebody has sighted the moon in Saudi Arabia or Lebanon or Pakistan or whatever, uh, these don't apply to us. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, let's look at it this way, that um, uh, we live in a different time zone. We live in North America. And, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, any prayer of the day that we offer, any Salat, um, when, let's say, uh, nowadays we offer a Fajr Salat at around 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, if you look at the situation in Saudi Arabia, at that time it's already 12 in the afternoon because mm -hmm. they're seven hours ahead of us. Right. So we don't follow their timings for Salat. And I don't see why Muslims should be following their claims of moon sighting. Right. We should be going with moon sighting right over here. And there is a committee here that determines and that gets uh, shahada from people in different parts of uh, the country. And over the last 30 or 35 years, alhamdulillah, they, they have been by and large accurate uh, sighting reports. And so we should go with our own North American determination rather than worrying about what anybody does in Saudi Arabia or Lebanon or, you know, Egypt or Libya or Pakistan or whatever. Uh, so that is what we should be doing. And that's the only way to avoid this confusion. So I suppose that nullifies the argument that Muslims should be fasting on the same day throughout the world for the purpose of unity. Exactly. Because uh, you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created the earth flat. I mean, if it were flat, then obviously the sun would rise at the same time everywhere. Right. Uh, you know, th everything would be exactly identical. Mm -hmm. But there are different time zones. For instance, uh, in North America, when we have, let's say, 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the morning, at that time, if you, let's say, consider Australia, they are anything from 12 to 16 hours ahead of us. So we are in the morning, they are already, the whole day is gone, mm -hmm. and they are, their n next day is starting. They are either 10, 30, 11 o'clock at, at night, or they may even be 1 or 2 a.m. the following day. So time zones are very different for, for different areas. Right. So in that sense, it is impossible for all the Muslims in the world to start fasting on the same day. And that's how Allah has created it. I and mean, that's mm -hmm. how Allah says that, you know, we have created different time zones, different times for days and nights. Anybody who travels, I mean, they know automatically, if you are traveling east, they are ahead of us. So like, you know, if let's say you want to travel from Canada to, to Pakistan, let's say you take a flight uh, one evening over here and you arrive the next evening over there, although the flight is 13 hours or so. Right. And that's because you get there the next evening because they are nine hours ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So you have regained those nine hours and that's why you arrived there. 
the same thing applies to the days of, of Ramadan or any other month. So because the earth is not flat, it is round and there are different time zones. So we cannot possibly, all of us, start Ramadan on the same day. And that's, that's why, uh, and that's how Allah has created it. And so we should be following our own uh, citing criteria and our own um, methodology in order to uh, start the fast and end the month of fasting. Could you shed some light on perhaps some of the scientific methods that are out there to help us determine when the start of Ramadan is? Oh, absolutely. There are actually, uh, now, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, modern science has progressed so much that we can get computer printouts for the next thousand years. I mean, if you want to know when Ramadan is going to start, because we can uh, calculate through computers the exact absolute second as to when the new moon is going to be born. Right. Okay, now let's understand first of all what is the birth of the new moon and that's where the confusion arises because the birth of the new moon is different from the sighting of the new moon. Now the birth of the new moon is when the moon, the sun and the earth are in conjunction. What this means is that these three bodies are in a straight line. So the earth is casting its complete shadow over the moon. I mean, how do we see the moon? We see the moon through the light that is that is a reflection of the light from the earth that reflects on the moon. So if the moon is completely in the shadow of the earth, then we don't see the moon. That's what's, what, what is, what is the, the time when the moon is completely dark, completely black. But it takes about anything from 24 hours or more for the moon to move away from the shadow of the earth. So that a little bit of light on the moon's surface is reflected from the earth and that's what we begin to see. Now as I said from the conjunction that means when earth, sun and moon are in one line it takes about a minimum of 24 hours. Sometimes it takes more because of the timings all kinds of different other factors but after the moon is born we have to wait for a minimum of 24 hours or more ordinarily more particularly in summers mm -hmm. before that that new moon can become visible. So this year for instance the moon is going to be born on Saturday, July the 30th at 2.39 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay. Now, by the evening when the sun sets at around 8.42 p.m., uh, the age of the moon is only six hours. It's impossible to sight a six-hour-old moon. It, as I said, it takes a minimum of 24 or more hours before the moon can become visible. The following day, the age of the moon is at the time of sunset approximately 30 hours. Now there's a much greater possibility but there are also other factors that we must keep in mind and that is as to when the sun sets and what time the moon sets. Mm -hmm. So this year on Sunday July the 31st uh, the sun will set at 8.42 p.m. and the moon will set at 8.58 p.m. That means that the moon will set 16 minutes after sunset. Right. So there is a possibility although very slight that in, at least in Toronto. In other places it may be greater. So we may still not see the Ramadan moon on Sunday, July the 31st night, although I'm quite confident that in other parts of North America, particularly places like Florida or further south, etc., we may be able to, uh, the, the sighting would be much easier. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the earliest start of Ramadan in North America is going to be uh, Monday, August the 1st. So the first sightings we would get on uh, July 31st, Sunday, July 31st, uh, so that we begin our fasting on Monday, August the 1st. Inshallah. Inshallah. Um, there's some people who may argue that, you know, if we start a day late or a day early, it doesn't really matter. But I'm curious to know why it's so critical for us to pay attention to the precise dates. Well, uh, you know, when we look at um, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains for us in terms of our ibadat. Uh, he has designated times and dates for every act of ibadat. Uh, if let's say, to give you a, a quick example with respect to uh, two salats, one is Maghrib salat. Now, Maghrib salat cannot be offered even one minute before sunset. I'm just talking about one minute, forget about days, just one minute, okay? Because the time for Maghrib Salat has not started, okay? So that means that timing is critical. Right. Uh, it has to be after sunset, not before sunset. Let's look at Jummah Salat. You know, we can 
offer Juma Salat only and only on Friday. We can't offer it on any other day because Allah has designated that day and He has designated that particular time. And so both days and times are crucial because Allah has designated them and He says that I'm going to give you the reward for that. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it the right way, then obviously we are depriving ourselves of Allah's barakah. So the start of Ramadan is also crucial in this sense that we start on the right date and then we can also then determine the last 10 nights which are the most crucial nights of Ramadan for our Ibadat and uh, Qiyamul Layl and Laylatul Qadr and all of these wonderful, wonderful nights. And if we don't start on the right date, then we are missing out those important dates. So it is very important that we keep track of this and understand that starting on the right date is what Allah has designated for us and only right. then we will get reward for it. So then what kind of preparations can we make as Muslims to help us obtain the maximum benefit from this beautiful month? Well, uh, obviously, um, uh, the, first, the first point is that we must make the niyyah, the intention. Because every act of ibadat is based on our intention. That means that we make the niyyah, that we are going to adhere to Allah's commands, that we are going to um, uh, follow what He's saying to us mm -hmm. so that we can get the maximum benefit out of it. Uh, there are also many other aspects uh, involved uh, with um, Ramadan. It includes, for instance, Tarawi prayers. It includes sort of getting up very early in the morning for suhoor um, and uh, fasting the whole day. That means we don't take food or, or any liquids or anything like that. And also we pray Tarawi prayers at night. It's a wonderful feeling of, you know, get together and, and the community spirit that evolves. Right. But above all, I think we should be conscious of the fact that when we go hungry, that it should create in us this feeling that there are many poor people in the world that go hungry almost every day. That's and right. so we should be conscious of their plight. And this is what the message of Islam is, that it should develop this feeling of uh, caring and sharing that we become conscious of those who are less fortunate than ourselves and that we share with them some of the blessings that Allah has bestowed upon us because I think let's be honest in North America we lead a very comfortable life and uh, we are very blessed with all kinds of you know blessings uh, and so Ramadan should help us to uh, develop that sense of taqwa that we talked about earlier and taqwa means becoming conscious of Allah's divine presence and of our own responsibilities to Allah's creatures. That it makes us better human beings, that we become more conscientious human beings, more caring human beings. And we develop that patience mm -hmm. uh, so that we develop our character. And it, these are all aspects related to the month of Ramadan. Um, now you touched upon it briefly, the Tarawi prayers, etc. Um, what are some other things or other events that occur during the month of Ramadan? Well, there are um, a number of um, other um, aspects um, in Ramadan. For instance, um, uh, you know, I mentioned Tarawi prayers, but in addition to that, um, in the last 10 nights, uh, we, we do what are referred to as Qiyamul Layl. And of course, these uh, last 10 nights, especially the odd nights, have been designated by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he urged the Muslims that um, they should seek uh, Laylatul Qadr in these last 10 nights or odd nights. Um, now, we don't know when Laylatul Qadr is, although some people speculate that it is the 27th night or whatever, but. Uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has not designated any particular night. Mm -hmm. He simply referred to the last 10 odd nights of right. uh, Ramadan. So that would be the 21st night, the 23rd, 25th, 27th or 29th, any of them. Uh, there are naturally special blessings that we get because, you know, as in, in this center, for instance, we have been um, uh, participating in Qiyamul Layls and it's a wonderful feeling like mm -hmm. you, know, you, you pray late at night and it's such a spiritual environment, you feel so uplifted, so sort of, you know, uh, so close to Allah. And then, of course, you know, after that whole night of ibadat, uh, then we do our suhoor and then we go home to, to get some rest. Uh, so that's uh, something that is uh, extremely important. Secondly, uh, in Ramadan, uh, we need to keep in mind that um, it was also the month in which the Noble Quran was revealed. 
And so it is an opportunity for us to not only read the Quran, but to study the Quran and understand it more and more. And that's of course what we do in Tarawih prayers. We, we listen to their beautiful recitation and, and also uh, make an effort to understand it so that then we can implement uh, these uh, teachings in our own lives. Now, if somebody is unable to fast during Ramadan, what can they do to make up for it? Okay. Um, there are basically two different categories of uh, people that are unable to fast. So, for instance, one would be uh, somebody who is traveling. And the Quran mentions this. Uh, you know, if let's say uh, somebody is going on a very long journey, like, you know, uh, flying to a very distant part where um, it becomes very difficult because the day is stretched, etc. Especially if, let's say, somebody is flying from Pakistan or the Middle East coming to North America, the day is stretched into, you know, much longer mm -hmm. because uh, we, we gain time, seven, eight, nine, ten hours, whatever. So one is the aspect of travel. The other is um, if somebody is sick, okay? Now, sickness can be temporary sickness or it could be um, long-term sickness. So I'm going to mention both. Um, for instance, temporary sickness would be somebody, for instance, fell ill, had a fever or whatever, um, and that uh, naturally they need to take medication for that. Uh, this is temporary, so then uh, we can make up for these things. This also involves, for instance, the, um, the women's um, uh, sort of in a situation when they are uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a month that they are unwell, that they don't fast during those days because purity is important. Like, you know, whatever we do, our ibadahs in a state of purity. Then there are, and of course these have to be made up for it, but then there are maybe permanent kinds of, uh, you know, illnesses, for instance, the elderly who may be very weak, they need medication all the time. They are weak so they can't fast, otherwise it would adversely affect them. Or uh, pregnant mothers, mm -hmm. because it's going to affect the, the, the baby, uh, and so they don't want to do that and they can't fast in those months. Or nursing mothers, right. because again it's going to affect the health of the baby or the mother. Now, Islam obviously does not wish to impose uh, these sort of difficulties. So, for these kinds of people, those who are very elderly and sick, uh, who need constant medication or pregnant mothers or nursing mothers, then they can pay what is referred to as fidya. And fidya basically is um, a compensation to feed hungry people. Right. And I would say that today it probably would be a minimum in the neighborhood of ten dollars per day it shouldn't be less than that because i think we know that today uh, ten dollars per day is the minimum amount to feed a person so if let's say there are elderly people people who are not well or sick if they can't fast or they can't make up for the fasts later on then they should pay the ten dollars per day fidya so in the month of ramadan it would come to three hundred dollars altogether and i would strongly urge that um, our brothers and sisters pay that in advance because this money has to be dispersed to the needy people in the month of Ramadan. They shouldn't wait until the end of the month because right. then the month of Ramadan is gone and they are, they can still pay, but I think they are then depriving themselves of the real blessings of course. That, that must come in the, in the month of Ramadan. So unfortunately our program has come to an end and inshallah we'll be able to continue this on our next program. Thank you for joining us, Brother Zafar. Well, it's my pleasure and I hope that uh, this discussion that we have had uh, would shed some light and help our brothers and sisters to understand the significance of Ramadan. We hope you found this program informative. Thank you for joining us on Muslim Perspectives and be sure to join us next week at the same time on the same channel. My name is Afifa Khawaja. Assalamu alaikum. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims, but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known, and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time, this book, Power Manifestations of the Sirah, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.